This December, we've been going over how to get to spiritual freedom. And we looked at gorillas. You know, what a gorilla is, is something that everybody else sees in your life, except you don't see it. And we discovered that the very first step of spiritual freedom is self-awareness. Learning to figure out where these gorillas are and changing them a little bit. And then last week, we talked about cookie cutter Christmas cookies. And, uh, you know, they come off the assembly line because you just punch them with the same cookie cutter. And we discovered the second step to uh, spiritual freedom was that t the discovery of our uniqueness. The image of God in all of it. It's different, but it's the same. And that's what keeps us from ever becoming cookie cutter people. And if you are unique, why would you ever want to become a cookie cutter kind of a person? Now today we're at step three. And I got to tell you, this one's hard. This one's called ownership. And it's the idea of taking personal responsibility for your life. And I'm going to be honest with you up front. It's not a popular subject. Taking responsibility for your, your life and the decisions you make is kind of a touchy service uh, subject. Some people can get mad pretty quick when you start messing with their responsibilities. Truth is, taking responsibility for your actions, your choices, your decision is just way too close to home for some people. But ownership is game changing. Ownership is just that important. In fact, we're not going to be able to go on till next week until we at least come to terms with ownership and accepting the responsibility for living your life. Somewhere. You have to leave this umbrella of victimhood and entitlement, and you've got to go in the direction of hope and empowerment. Now, we'll start out with something really unpopular and go even more unpopular in a minute. The things that happen to you in life may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. Wow. May not be your fault, but it's still your responsibility. And here's the other thing I want to say. <laughs> you can't blame your way to freedom. And if you remember nothing else today except those two things, I mean, it's done deal. It's a good deal, good service. The things that happen to me may not be my fault, but they are still my responsibility. And I cannot blame my way to freedom. Now, by the way, ownership, taking responsibilities to partnership. We'll talk some more about that next week, but I want you to think of it this way. Imagine that we are stuck in a deep, deep ditch. Well, God provides the ladder, but we have to provide the legs. So there's this partnership thing here about taking responsibility. And we need an image. And so there's today's image, not a gorilla, not sausage or potatoes or what all that. Olive Garden breadsticks. Ooh. You make a meal on them. You really can. You don't need to buy the food. Just eat the breadsticks. And you say, what in the world does that have to do with anything you're even talking about? I need to confess that a big part of this message that you're getting today comes out of a small group uh, Bible study manual. And it was written by Mike Foster, okay? And he tells this story when he was in high school. He worked for Olive Garden, and it was horrible for him. I wouldn't mind it, I don't think. But for him, it was a horrible experience. In a lot of ways, it was embarrassing. But he said he thought about quitting over and over and over again except the only thing that stopped him were the breadsticks. Because <laughs> you see, back then, if you worked for Olive Garden, you could eat all the breadsticks you wanted. They were absolutely free, and you could eat them at any time you wanted to. 
And so Mike endured several years of a job he didn't really enjoy uh, to keep the bread streaks. Now, I honestly don't know everything you're going through right now. I know some of you are going through some tough times. I know some of you have gone through some tough seasons. And whatever storm you're going through, I just hope you will find the breadsticks. Because I do believe that in every situation, God leaves breadsticks, and they sort of take the edge off of everything else. And even if you feel like quitting, look for the breadsticks. And how do you find the breadsticks? Well, you do what we're talking about today. You become owner of your life. You start taking responsibility for your own actions and decisions. A breadstick simply is something good you can find. I mean, you say, my life may have looked like that yesterday. Or it may look like this today, but I'm going to take ownership and I'm going to find the good and the blessing for tomorrow. That's where we begin. Now we're going to begin with five things that this uh, Mike Foster writes about in his study manual. And he calls them the five bummer dudes. <laughs> now it, it's an older book, okay? It's, it's dated. And this guy lives, I think he still does, in Southern California. And come on, all of us talked like this back when Baywatch was on TV. Uh, but he just called... So, all right, if you don't know what bummer dude means, pretend this. You're in your house. Your best friend comes over and says, my canary died the other day. Well, the Southern California response is, bummer, dude. Serious? You just, how many of you watch Bay Watch? Come on. Doesn't know. At least you still tell the truth. Okay, here they are. I told you we we're going to start with negative and get even worse. Life is unfair. Well, we fight that. Life should be fair. But it's not. It's never going to be. Bummer, dude. It's not going to work. People will hurt you. People at work, people in your family, people in your own church. Hopefully not, you know, planned that away. Yesterday is gone. You can't change it. You cannot undo a mistake. You're not in control. Boy, this, this just grates at a lot of people. You might think you are, but give you another 20 years, 30 years, you'll figure out you're not in control. And then if I haven't filled you with enough excitement so far with this list, you're going to die. Bummer, dude. <laughs> Let's just take the offering again and go home and hope for something better next week. The point is, though, you can fight against those things all you want, but you'll never win because they are true. However, when you take responsibility for things like this, it's going to sound a little bit more like this next slide. Life is unfair, but I know God's just, and He will even the score. People will hurt me, but God will never leave me. Yesterday is gone, but God is blessing my today. I'm not in control, but God is, and I can deal with that. And yeah, we're all going to die one day, but if we know Jesus, we'll live with God forever. Now, taking responsibility, here's a good place to start. You know, this is like precursor. Do with them. But now let's let the Bible weigh in on this subject, because I mean, after all, that's where we get the truth from. Genesis chapter 3 does a wonderful job of unpacking ownership responsibility, and placing blame. I know you know the story, but read along with me. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Well, of course we can eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, we'll die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. 
God knows your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, we're having a dialogue here between the devil and Eve. And, and ladies, Eve is starting out well. She's putting up a good battle here. She has all the right answers. She's saying what God expected her to say. She's stepping up for God, but she's losing the battle. The next verse, she saw the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious. And she really did want the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Oh, by the way, an interesting little side note here. It took the devil himself to deceive the woman. It only took a naked woman to deceive the man. Think about that. Some things haven't changed for 8,000 years. <laughs> so they sowed fig leaves. Took you a while on that one, didn't it? <laughs> to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, and they hid from the Lord God. Then the Lord God called to the man, <coughs> Where are you? I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid, and I was afraid because I was naked. Well, who told you you were naked? The Lord God asked, Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? This is your point, Adam. Man up. This is your place to shape manhood for 5,000 years. Be a man. Tell the truth. And Adam said, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Whoa. You now have the first example in history of a man blaming a woman for his problems. It's her fault. It is all the woman's fault. He is such a whiner. She's to blame, but listen. Look close. It was the woman you gave me. He's blaming God. If you hadn't given me this woman, I would have never done this terrible thing. He's a goober. And actually, God, it's your fault. Well, then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? Serpent deceived me. She replied, That's why I ate it. Kudos. She's absolutely being honest here. But she's still blaming somebody else for her actions and choices. And don't miss the point of Genesis chapter 3. From the first day of history, we keep blaming other people for the problems we make. It's their fault. It's my ex's fault. It's my family's fault. It's that teacher's fault. It's the government's fault. That is not taking ownership. That is just blaming. Nobody had to teach Adam and Eve to blame. They were just created that way. If you have kids, you don't have to teach your kids how to blame. They know that automatically. It's a teacher's fault. She's not a good teacher. She doesn't understand me. I'm special. Take ownership, not blame. Now, the reason we don't take ownership, because psychologists have actually discovered that when we blame other people for our problems, it really does make us feel better. And there is some comfort to be found by blaming everything on other people. But it only works for a couple minutes. It doesn't work in the long run, and it, it just doesn't stay permanent. Learning to take ownership, complete ownership for your life, yeah, that's one thing that's going to fix it. So I have three things to say based on what we've talked about with the, the breadsticks and also heard from the Genesis chapter 3. 
Number one, my past refines me, but it does not define me. Isaiah says, forget the former things. Don't dwell in the past. I'm doing a new thing. I want you to think about your past for just a second. At your story, I mean, maybe you've struggled with addiction, or you made some really poor choices, or you, you grew up in a very difficult family situation. And, and regardless, I want you to think about how you look at your past. Now, this is, again, from the, the Bible study, and it's a little tricky, but there's two ways to deal with your past. Number one is sort of called under-ownership. You don't have enough ownership. And all you do is dwell on the fact that you're a victim. I have been hurt so bad, and it's, the majority of your focus is how other people have hurt me and hurt me so bad. And when it comes to the other slices of the pie, like how you hurt yourself from time to time and how you've hurt other people, you don't really care about them because, I mean, you're preoccupied with what they have done to you. And there's a lot of folk who, who live like that. There is another option, though, and it's over-ownership. And you now focus on how I've hurt other people. Not so much how I've been hurt or how I've hurt myself. It's just, oh, I have hurt somebody so bad. Oh, the pain that I have caused my children. Oh, the pain that I've caused my parents or my friends. I've messed life up so bad. And folk like this, they don't really even have the time to look at how to deal with those other things about how they might have hurt somebody or how they've been physically or abusively hurt. What should it look like? Obviously, everything equal. Surrounded by God's grace. Because we all deal with those things in our past. And not one of those categories is more important than the other. And ownership means you've, you, you realize that. And you're not going to beat yourself up because of how bad people have been to you or how bad you've been to somebody else. You're going to realize that you're just going to deal with those three possibilities you all face. Because my past refines me, but it won't define me. Well, number two, I am going to be more committed to being free than placing blame. This is hard. You thought I couldn't beat that bummer thing, bummer dude thing. Some of you might not speak to me after I read this next sentence to you. Sometimes we're more interested in being right than being healed. We're more interested in placing the blame, pointing the finger, it's their fault, than saying, I really want to be healed. I want to experience joy and happiness. I want my heart to be touched. So where are you? Are you working now to get free of the hurt? Are you working now just to keep finding the blame, to keep that going? And that's a hard question because it, in my life, I know it's, it's easier sometimes to just keep chasing the details of who was right and who was wrong in this situation rather than just asking, God, can I just get on with it and feel good about who I am as a person? Because it is easier to blame. You feel better when you blame somebody else. I didn't make that up. That's psychology 101. It just doesn't last. And it never gets rid of the bitterness that's underneath the blame. Now, one last little illustration. Say, right after church, you're going to go out to, to lunch. Maybe I made you hungry for breadsticks. And you're going to be in an accident and... Somebody's going to sideswipe your car. There's two different people you can call. The one is the police. The other is the ambulance. And they will both come as soon as they can to get to the scene. However, the police will be concerned about the details. 
How fast were you going? How fast was the other car going? Who hit who? Who is at fault? <coughs> Ambulance people, they're going to just come to help. They're not going to be concerned at all about who was at fault or anything like that. They just want to heal you. They want to save your life. So think about this. In your journey right now, are you spending more time with the police or the ambulance driver? Are you spending more time for the police to figure out who was really right and, and who really was to blame and wanting justice? Or are you wanting healing? And the really neat thing is that in the church, the ambulance driver is named Jesus and he really does want to heal. He wants to rescue us. He wants to take away that hurt and pain. <clears throat> Ownership means I'm committed more to the healing than finding out who to blame. Final point, very short one. I recognize that life is hard. Come on down, praise team. But I trust that God is good. I admit it, if you don't know it already, I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. I have just never really appreciated poetry at all. And I typically blow right past the things that people post on Facebook. I, I don't even Facebook on, on most days, but typically I see something on Facebook and I just blow right past it because that's, that's just the nerd and geek in me. Except I did see this uh, a while ago. It's on the screen. I hope you can read it. It says, life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. Life is learning how to dance in the rain. Now, I, again, I don't know your story. I don't know the things that you're fighting against right now, but I'm just saying don't quit. Keep fighting. Find the breadsticks. Find those little positive moments where God's blessing. But you have to take responsibility. <coughs> you might have some unpopular decisions you have to make, but you... They are your decisions, and you're the one who has to make them. Take responsibility for your story, ownership for your life, and get away from blaming. I know it's easy, but just get away from it. And realize that it may not have been your fault, but it's your life. It's still your responsibility. But choose God. And choose that ambulance driver who loves you so much. Stand as we share a final song this morning.